The End of Utopia, Politics and Culture in an Age of Apathy, by Russell Jacoby. This is chapter one. The end of the end of the end of ideology. In September 1955, several hundred writers and scholars from Raymond Aaron to Arthur Schlesinger Jr. assembled in Milan's National Museum of Science and Technology to discuss the future of freedom. Their outlook was roughly liberal and anti-communist, their mood upbeat. Stalin had died. The new first secretary of the Soviet Communist Party, Nikita Khrushchev, spoke of detente, detente and peace. Western Europe and the United States were prospering. Perhaps Marxism had a future in the underdeveloped nations, but elsewhere its days seemed past. One participant observed that an atmosphere of a post-victory ball prevailed. There was, noted Edward Schills, a sometimes rampant, sometimes quiet conviction that communism had lost the battle of ideas with the West. In most Western societies, the ideological controversy is dying down, stated Aaron in an opening address. History has refuted the exaggerated hopes placed in revolution. Aaron admitted that tensions still arise over equality, employment, wages, and inflation, but the reasonable anxieties they evoke do not give rise to any fundamental conflict. Serious people now agree on the basic framework of the welfare state. Several months later, Khrushchev startled the, the delegates to the party congress with a secret speech denouncing Stalin as a murderer, liar, and maniac. Of 139 members of a previous Central Committee, 70% had been arrested and shot, Khrushchev announced. Or let us take the matter of the Stalin Prizes, he continued. Not even the Tsars created prizes, which they named after themselves. After decades in which Stalin had been deified, the hold no punches indictment stunned the delegates. The transcript of the speech underlined the response, animation in the hall tumult in the hall. Not only in the hall, news of the secret speech caused dismay among loyal communists around the globe. For many critics, including those who had gathered in Milan, the Khrushchev speech only confirmed the ideological dissolution. Moreover, communism suffered other blows in the mid-1950s. Widespread protests in East Berlin riots in Poland, and a Soviet invasion of Hungary to put down a, rev a revolt. The Berlin strikes on June 17, 1953, inspired Bol Bertolt Brecht's mordant poem, The Solution. After the uprising of the 17th June, the Secretary of the Writers' Union had leaflets distributed in the Stalin Ali, stating that the people had forfeited the confidence of the government and can win it back only by redoubled efforts. Would it not be easier in that case for the government to dissolve the people and elect another? Raymond Aaron's The Opium of the Intellectuals, his criticism of Marxism, appeared just before the party congress. Aaron, who had been a principal organizer of the Milan Conference, evoked what he called the end of the age of ideology, or the end of the ideological age. Ideology meant revolution and utopianism. These were finished. No one could pretend that an alternative to advanced capitalism existed. Imperfect and unjust as Western society is in many respects, it has progressed sufficiently so that reforms appear more promising than violence and unpredictable disorder. Nor could we return to a pure laissez-faire economy. Undiluted capitalism was also obsolete. Liberalism and socialism were no longer pure doctrines or pure opposites. Western capitalist society today comprises a multitude of socialist institutions. The old ideologies were over. In a foreword to an American edition published after Khrushchev's speech, Aaron wondered, is there still a need to denounce the opium of the intellectuals? He asked, didn't Stalin carry off with him in death not only Stalinism, but also the age of ideology? Aaron joined a chorus of voices in Europe and the United States that intensified during the 1950s. The authors proclaimed, celebrated, and sometimes lamented the end of ideology and utopia. 
they did not simply glorify unvarnished capitalism. Rather, they argued that the new economic and political realities had advanced beyond both Adam Smith and Karl Marx. The welfare state encompassed politics, modifying, not transforming, liberal capitalism defined the future. Nevertheless, their emphasis lay on the demise of the radical vision. The term end of ideology may have first appeared in the writings of Albert Camus, the French essayist and novelist. In a 1946 piece for Combat, the resistance newspaper he edited, Camus criticized the recent efforts of French socialists to reconcile Marxism and ethics. For Camus, this could not be done. The Marxist belief that ends justify the means legitimates murder. The socialists had to choose to either accept or reject Marxism as an absolute philosophy. In doing the latter, socialists would show that, that our time marks the end of ideologies, that is, absolute utopias, which in reality destroy themselves. Several years later, a junior Harvard professor, H. Stuart Hughes, used the term end of ideology in a report on the mood of European intellectuals. Hughes observed that the leftist European intellectual now realized with considerable sense of shock that he preferred capitalism to communism. The end of the mystique of the left is the clearest sign of what has happened since the war. The left lacks conviction and ideas, he stated in his 1951 essay. The End of Political Ideology Many scholars and commentators in the 1950s presented kindred arguments. Judith N. Schklar titled the last chapter of her After Utopia, The Decline of Political Faith, The End of Radicalism. Radicalism, she wrote, has gone totally out of fashion. It requires a minimum of utopian faith that people can transform their social environment. But today, this spirit is lacking. Socialism has not been able to recover the lost spirit of utopian idealism and is neither radical nor hopeful today. She concluded, all that need really be stated is that socialism no longer has anything to say. Seymour Martin Lipset agreed. Politics is now boring, he stated in his 1960 Political Man, quoting a Swedish journalist. The only issues are whether the metal workers should get a nickel more an hour, the price of milk should be raised, or old age pensions extended. For Lipset, as for Aaron, the fundamental political problems of the Industrial Revolution no longer give rise to ideological disputes. He put it emphatically, This very triumph of the democratic social revolution in the West ends domestic politics for those intellectuals who must have ideologies or utopias to motivate them to political action. Daniel Bell's The End of Ideology offered the sharpest formulation. The old 19th century ideologies were exhausted, undermined by the horrors of Soviet communism and the success of liberal capitalism. Such calamities as the Moscow trials, the Nazi-Soviet pact, the concentration camps, the suppression of the Hungarian workers, formed one chain of events. Such social changes as the modification of capitalism, the rise of the welfare state, another. At the end of the 1950s, Bell stated, the old passions are spent, and the old politico-economic radicalism has lost its meaning. The situation seemed clear. The ideological age has ended. As Bell put it, in the Western world, therefore, there is a rough consensus among intellectuals on political issues. The acceptance of a welfare state, the desirability of decentralized power, a system of mixed economy and of political pluralism. The End of Ideology, published in 1960, closed with reflections on the fate of younger intellectuals in a world that had put radicalism and utopianism to rest. The new generation, with no meaningful memory of old debates, finds itself in a society that has rejected apocalyptic and chaotic visions. There is a restless search for new intellectual radicalism, but nothing is found. Ideology is intellectually devitalized. Politics offers little excitement. Social reforms do not provide a unifying appeal. Whether the intellectuals in the West can find passions outside of politics is moot. Two years later, Bell brought out a slightly revised edition of the End of Ideology, registering a small shift in political realities. Between 1960 and 1962, something had appeared on the scene, a new left. 
To close the book on ideology, Bell now added, is not to turn one's back upon it. This is all the more important now when a new left with few memories of the past is emerging. Bell wondered what, where it was going and what its politics entailed. For good reason. In the early 1960s, history was speeding up and radicalism found a new life. Ideological conflict was intensifying, not weakening. Fidel Castro swept into Havana in 1959, and two years later, the United States broke off relations with Cuba. Castro and his comrade-in-arms, Che Guevara, appeared to many as romantic heroes, inspiring revolution throughout the Americas. Students protesting segregation in the southern states galvanized support from youth in the north. A new politics was spreading across the land. Walking through Harvard Square in 1960 recalls Todd Gil Gitlin in, the hit in his history of the 1960s. I saw a poster tacked on a telephone pole. It announced a rally against nuclear weapons with a speech by Eric Fromm and music by Pete Seeger and Joan Bates. The previous year, I might have passed such a notice with barely a glance, but this one was irresistible. Something had changed, and not simply for Gitlin. That night, the arena was jammed with 6,000 people. The new left in the 1960s resist a brief summary. It remains disputed when the 1960s began what they accomplished, or when they ended. For some conservatives, the 1960s are only too alive. The origin of America's malaise, drug problem, and underclass. A fairer account might credit the 1960s with ending the war in Vietnam and creating a new awareness of racial and social inequalities. Few doubt that the 1960s marked a period of relentless disputation. Not only a political revolution, but a revolution in life, morals, and sexuality was discussed, and sometimes pursued. The 1960s slogan, the personal is political, meant that private life, once considered outside of politics, was now the subject of manifestos and criticism. The 1960s buried talk of the end of ideology. At least this is what many believed. Already in 1960, C. Wright Mills, the radical sociologist, denounced the end of ideology proponents as smug conservatives, tired liberals, and disappointed radicals. Ultimately, the end of ideology is based upon a disillusionment with any real commitment to socialism. Its partisans believe that in the West, there are no more real issues. The mixed economy plus the welfare state plus prosperity, that is the formula. U.S. capitalism will continue to be workable. For Mills, this was bunk. The end of ideology was on the way out. A new left was emerging that was not afraid to be utopian. Is not our utopianism a major source of our strength? Our theoretical work is indeed utopian, in my own case at least, deliberately so. What needs to be changed is not merely first this, then that detail, but the structure of institutions, the foundations of policies. For the next several decades, the end of ideology thesis took a beating. The civil rights movement, black power, anti-war protests, national liberation struggles, feminism. The world seemed drenched in revolution and ideology. What is the evidence for the increasingly fashionable thesis of the gradual extinction of ideology in the West? Asked an observer in 1967. He found little and argued in an essay titled The End of the End of Ideology, that ideology was waxing stronger than ever. Bell's argument stated another commentator smacked of the past. The 60s have now passed their halfway mark, and it seems that perhaps Bell's death sentence was a bit premature. One would have thought a few years ago, stated another analyst, that the age of ideology was at an end. The emerging student movement, however, refuted the idea. In 1968, using Bell's phrase as an epigraph, Christopher Lash blasted the notion of the end of ideology. All of Western society faces insurrectionary threats from within, stated Lash. Vietnam has exploded the Cold War consensus. Riots threaten to become a permanent feature of urban life. Militant blacks attack America and support third world revolutions. Students are rebelling in Paris, Berlin, Rome, and Madrid. For Lash, post-industrial society generated new conflicts. We are witnessing a revival of ideology. 
Not so very long ago, summarized a reviewer in 1972, Raymond Aaron Daniel Bell and Seymour Martin Lipset, among others, were confidently predicting the decline of ideological fervor in the Western industrialized countries. This was wrong. The past two decades have been characterized by a growth and proliferation of total ideologies. Little seems more bankrupt than the notion of a widespread agreement in the welfare state and pluralism. Nothing seemed more ridiculous than the pronouncement of the demise of fundamental political fissures, the end of ideology, until today. In 1989, communism collapsed in Eastern Europe. The disintegration of the Soviet Union soon followed. History does not repeat itself, but sometimes it comes close. When Erich Honecker, the East German leader, learned of the mass demonstrations in Leipzig in October 1989, he asked, referring to the strikes of 1953, is it another 17th of June? It was, and worse, since this, since this time the people dissolved the state and indicted Honecker for crimes against its citizens. The events of 1989 mark a decisive shift in the zeitgeist. History has zigged or zagged. No simple lesson follows, but it is clear that radicalism and the utopian spirit that sustains it have ceased to be major political or even intellectual forces. Nor is this pertinent simply to adherents of the left. The vitality of liberalism rests on its left flank, which operates as its goad and critic. As the left surrenders a vision, liberalism loses its bearings. It turns flaccid and uncertain. Bell had it right, only he did not draw out all the consequences, and he jumped the gun. To use Bell's words from 1960, responsible political thinkers believe in the acceptance of a welfare state, the desirability of decentralized power, a system of mixed economy and of political pluralism. Who objects to these now? However, Bell missed a fundamental irony. The defeat of radicalism bleeds liberalism of its vitality. To be sure, reading the zeitgeist leaves room for argument. Many pretend that nothing has changed. With bravado or blindness, they repeat familiar adages. In 1995, Paul Lauder, a leftist English professor, denounced the end of ideology as the rant of quacks. The Academy has always had its share of charlatans, lowlifes, and scurvy reprobate reprobates. They produced an Aryanized version of the classics, faked twin studies, history without black writers, and my favorite bit of academic nonsense, the end of ideology. Lauder is hardly alone. Nevertheless, the evidence is everywhere that the wisdom of lowlifes speaks to the present better than the dicta of well-heeled English professors. A seismic shift in political and cultural realities has taken place. To put it bluntly, the demise of communism eviscerates radicalism and enfeebles liberalism. Francis Fukuyama's much-discussed The End of History and The Last Man partly addressed this issue. His argument reformulated with a philosophical flourish the more prosaic end of ideology, end of ideology proposition. Fukuyama added Hegel and Alexander Kojev, a Russian-French Hegelian, to Daniel Bell. In an article that preceded the book, Fukuyama stated that the triumph of the West, of the Western idea, is evident, first of all, in total exhaustion of viable syst systematic alternatives to Western liberalism. Even the language evokes the end of ideology, whose subtitle referred to the exhaustion of political ideas. Fukuyama sensed an affinity between his and Bell's positions and tried to distance himself from Bell. The ultimate triumph of Western liberal democracy, he wrote, does not lead to an end of ideology or a convergence between capitalism and socialism, but to an unabashed victory of economic and political liberalism. Yet this was exactly Bell's argument, not a convergence, but the victory of welfare or liberal capitalism. Fukuyama defends the same proposition. He admits isolated Marxists may exist in places like Managua, Pyongyang, or Cambridge, but radicalism now lacks historical force or future. Misgivings cloud Fukuyama's good cheer. With the demise of radical opposition, passion and idealism also depart. Only commercial regulations and tariffs remain contentious. 
alluding to the fact that the brilliant Kojev ended his days organizing a trade group, the European Common Market. Fukuyama regretted that a growing common marketization defines the future. In the original article, Fukuyama ended on a bittersweet note that recalls Bell's doubts. Fukuyama expressed nostalgia for the history of big ideas and robust ideologies. The end of history will be a very sad event. The struggle for recognition, the willingness to risk one's life for a purely abstract goal, the worldwide ideological struggle that calls forth daring courage, imagination, and idealism, will be replaced by economic calculation, the endless solving of technical problems, environmental concerns, and the satisfaction of sophisticated consumer demands. In the post-historical period, there will be neither art nor philosophy, just the perpetual caretaking of the Museum of Human History. Fukuyama's argument has provoked extensive and damaging criticism, but at least half still, half still stands. In the book version, Fukuyama perceived a worldwide liberal revolution or a universal history of mankind in the direction of liberal democracy. He announced not simply the end of ideology, but the end of history. However, history did not end, and liberal democracy will not triumph everywhere. Authoritarianism and despotism have a glorious future. On these issues, Fukuyama overplayed his hand. Moreover, he paid no mind to a paradoxical result of defeated leftism, the loss of liberal resolve and clarity. Yet his statement that the hour of radicalism is past rings true. Apart from a few diehards and stray capitals and campuses, intellectuals have become willy-nilly liberals. In our grandparents' time, many reasonable people could foresee a radiant socialist future in which private property and capitalism had been abolished. Today, by contrast, we have trouble imagining a world that is radically better than our own, or a future that is not essentially democratic and capitalist. Within that framework, of course, many things could be improved. Homeless, minorities, jobs. We can also imagine future worlds that are significantly worse than what we know now. But we cannot picture to ourselves a world that is essentially different from the present one, and at the same time better. Fukuyama stated a verity that many refuse to acknowledge. Today, socialists and leftists do not dream of a future qualitatively different from the present. To put it differently, radicalism no longer believes in itself. Once upon a time, leftists acted as if they could fundamentally reorganize society, Intellectually, the belief fed off, of a, fed off a utopian vision of a different society. Psychologically, it rested on self-confidence about one's place in history. Politically, it depended on the real prospects. Today, the vision has faltered. The self-confidence drained away. The possibilities dimmed. Almost everywhere, the left con contracts, not simply politically, but perhaps more decisively, intellectually. To avoid contemplating the defeat and its implications, the left now largely speaks the language of liberalism, the idiom of pluralism and rights. At the same time, liberals divested of a left wing suffer from, a wa from waning determination and imagination. At best, radicals and leftists envision a modified society with bigger pieces of pie for more customers. They turn utilitarian, liberal, and celebratory. The left once dismiss dismissed the market as exploitative, it now honors the market as rational and humane. The left once disdained mass culture as exploitative. Now it celebrates it as rebellious. The left once honored independent intellectuals as courageous. Now it sneers at them at, as elitist. The left once rejected pluralism as superficial. Now it worship, worships it as profound. We are witnessing not simply the defeat of the left, but its conversion and perhaps inversion. Of course, this interpretation of the recent past can be challenged. Why charge radicals with the grievous misdeeds of Stalinism? Why accuse the wider left of the crimes of Soviet Marxism? For the last 40 years, certainly in the United States, the left harbored little sympathy for Stalinism or Stalinist regimes in Eastern Europe. Sift through stacks of leftist tracts, tracts newspapers and leaflets of the 1960s and 1970s, and you'll be hard-pressed to find a single word praising East Germany or Poland. The new left broke with the old left on this very issue, Stalinism. The new left wanted nothing to do with authoritarian leaders, bureaucratic functionaries in barracks, communism. 
For this reason, the new left scandalized not simply conservatives, but stolid communists who considered it too anarchistic. Communist parties almost everywhere reacted with horror to the new left. Anti-communist myths in left disguise, a typical book by communist Aparachik from the 1970s, attacked new leftists as anarchists and libertines. It is possible to go further. The new left helped break up Stalinism. Here and there, writes the critic Paul Berman in his tale of two utopias, the leaders of the revolutions of 89, Avaklav Havel in Czechoslovakia, and Adam Michnik in Poland, turned out to be the same heroic persons, now adult liberals, who as young radicals had helped lead the movements of 68, just to show the relation of one uprising to the next. Michnik at least half agrees. For my generation, he has written, the road to freedom began in 1968. He admits that at first glance, rebelling students in Berkeley and Paris on one side and those in Warsaw and Prague on the other shared little. The former rejected democratic liberties and championed the communist project. The latter championed democratic liberties and rejected communism. Nevertheless, I think there were also some common threads the anti-authoritarian spirit, a sense of emancipation, and the conviction that to be a realist means to demand the impossible. <clears throat> Havel also found sustenance in 1960s culture, partly derived from a 1968 visit to New York. The Czech dissident movement, writes Berman, was an odd confirmation of some of the wilder youth culture theories that became popular circa 1969 in the American New Left. When Czech authorities banned a rock group, the Plastic People, Havel and others rallied to their defense in a committee that eventually became Chapter 77, which spearheaded the opposition for the next 10 years. Almost confirming the argument, after less than a month in office, the new Czech president Havel invited Frank Zappa to Prague. He was met by ecstatic fans, hippies from 1968 preserved in amber. In Berman's words, the Czechs were delighted to point out, Timothy, Timothy Garton Ash observed, that 89 and 68 turned upside down. Yet to credit the new left for undermining Stalinism is a stretch. Perhaps it played a small role in Czechoslovakia and Poland, nothing more. Nor is there a need to be simplistic about the new left. What the new left did over 20-odd years cannot be neatly categorized. Some individuals despised the old left. Some came out of the old left and never abandoned Stalinism. Other individuals and in splinter groups re-embraced it. For instance, in 1972, a mainstream American publisher, Doubleday, brought out a collection of Stalin's writings edited by H. Bruce Franklin, a new leftist English professor. His introduction began this way. I used to think of Joseph Stalin as a tyrant and butcher who jailed and killed millions, betrayed the Russian Revolution, sold out liberation struggles. Franklin continued, but to, about a million, or, but to about a billion people today, a billion and one including Franklin, Stalin is the opposite of what we in the capitalist world believe. According to Franklin, who is now a chaired professor at Rutgers University, Stalin was an authentic liberator, a true leader who was revered by working people throughout the world. This stuff was hard to take in, this stuff was hard to take in 1972. Indeed, it would have been hard to take in 1932, but it was not representative of the new left. No matter, setting forth the history of the new left is important, but most people ignore it. Anarchists, Trotskyists, and new leftists might despise Stalinism, but they partake in the wider left and share its fate. This is indisputable. The demise of the Soviet Union and its communist allies eviscerates the idea of socialism. Intellectually cogent protests in the name of an unsullied socialism or classical Marxism are both necessary and useless. With the final collapse of the Soviet system, writes the French leftist André Gortz, it is not just a variety of socialism that has collapsed. What has also collapsed is the conception of authentic socialism or communism. Numerous critics and observers have seen the handwriting on the wall although their interpretations differ. Eric Hobsbawm, a veteran Marxist historian, admits, 
Those of us who believe that the October Revolution was the gate to the future of world history have been shown to be wrong. He concedes that today there is no part of the world that credibly rep represents an alternative system to capitalism, which has once again proved that it remains the most dynamic force in world development. Robin Blackburn, editor of The New Left Review, concurs. The ruin of Marxist-Leninist communism has been sufficiently comprehensive to eliminate it as an alternative to capital capitalism and to compromise the very idea of socialism. The debacle of Stalinism has embraced reform communism and has brought no benefit to Trotskyism or social democracy or any socialist current. For the left in South America, writes George E. Castaneda, the fall of socialism in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe represents the end of a stirring, effective, nearly century-old utopia. Indeed, the very notion of an overall alternative to the status quo has been severely questioned. The idea of revolution itself, central to Latin American radical thought for decades, has lost its meaning. Exactly. Socialism may not be dead, but confidence in a new and different society is. Instead of championing a radical idea of a new society, the left ineluctably retreats to smaller ideas, seeking to expand the options within the existing society. Immediately after noting the link between 89 and 68, Ash observes the difference, the absence of a new socialism, or the, fuck, sorry. Um, Ash observes the difference, the absence of a new socialism or utopia. The Eastern European left does not reach for a new society beyond capitalism. Rather, it supports parliamentary democracy, rule of law, and a market economy, the familiar institutions of Western Europe and North America. Michnik concurs. He notes the common threads linking 68 and 89, but emphasizes the contrast. At that time, he writes of the 1960s, we defined ourselves as socialists and people of the left, but now this formula gives rise to an internal protest. After living in a communist utopia for 40 years, he can no longer subscribe to its ideology. Michnik is not alone. As the English Czech scholar Ernest Gellner stated shortly before his death, no one, virtually no one, has a good word to say for Marxism itself. Never was a sinking ship abandoned with such alacrity and unanimity. Never was an experiment condemned so conclusively. Even Misha Glenny, who tries in his informed study of the East European revolutions to salvage socialism, comes up short. His very title, The Rebirth of History, implies that Francis Fukuyama's idea of the end of history and socialism is misleading. To a degree, he is surely right. When he witnessed Alexander Dubček, who had been deposed by the Soviets 20 years earlier, addressing a half million cheering Czechs in, in 1989, Glenny, along with the throngs, melted into tears. It was the only way to comprehend what I was witnessing, the rebirth of a history that the forces of reaction thought they had killed off forever. Other observers agree that the events of 1989 could be read not as the end of history, but its beginning. The long night of repressive communism had lifted. In 1989, several hundred thousand Hungarians gathered for a massive state funeral. The reburial of their president, Imre Nagy, executed following the Soviet invasion of 1956. This was an act of liberation and sadness. The somber and sometimes even tearful mood of the huge crowd, writes a historian, testified to the depth of the emotional burden of powerlessness and humiliation that Hungarians had felt since 1956. Now they were taking charge of their fate. Nevertheless, as David Marquand observes, the crowds that thronged the squares of Eastern Europe were acting in the spirit of the French or American, not the Bolshevik Revolution. They were protesting against the October Revolution and against Marxism. Even Glenny admits that for Eastern Europeans, the vocabulary associated with socialism is identified with economic failure and political repression. The socialism that survives in Eastern Europe consists of little more than a skepticism about the market and a desire to preserve a social security network. In other words, this socialism does not differ from a Western end of ideology liberalism bound to the welfare state and planning small improvements to it. 
The point is, everywhere the left becomes practical, pragmatic, and liberal. We perhaps need to rethink and reconstruct the concept of socialism, writes Douglas Kellner, a leftist professor, in an essay titled The Obsolescence of Marxism. Perhaps socialism should be seen more as, an, as a normative ideal than as a historical force. Socialist thought, writes Norman Birnbaum, in an overview of the plight of socialism, is defensive, with no grand new projects or hopes. European socialists are chastened, content with very small stakes, afraid to ask more of themselves and their electorates. The brute fact summarizes Stanley Aronowitz is that there is little to distinguish the U.S. left from yesterday's everyday social welfare liberalism. Most appalling, we live in a time when the left has run out of ideas. One of the left's savviest thinkers concedes that the outlook is grim. None of the political currents that set out to challenge capitalism in this century has morale or compass today, concludes Perry Anderson in a lengthy encounter with Fukuyama. The socialist vision has fallen into radical doubt. What is true of the socialists need hardly be proved for those closer to the center, liberals. The differences between these political categories have never been clear, but it can, but it can be safely assumed <clears throat> that if leftists have abandoned a belief in a different future, liberals commit themselves more than ever to the welfare state. As the philosopher Richard Rorty puts it, we liberals have plausible we liberals have no plausible large scale scenario for the future. We have no ideas analogous to those of our grandfathers for changing the world. We must junk the big proposals and ideas that misled us in the past. I hope that we can banalize the entire vocabulary of leftist political deliberation. We must drop the term capitalism and conclude that bourgeois de democratic welfare states are the best we can hope for. In an era without a left, political philosophers like Michael J. Sandel use a new or refurbished vocabulary to revive liberalism. He tells us in his well-received book, Democracy's Discontent, that we need a new political agenda informed by the civic strand of freedom. What does that mean? The answer must be not much or not clear. Goodwill and earnestness mark Sandal's book, but its language turns soapy with incessant calls for civic virtue and republican freedoms. A political agenda informed by civic concerns would invite disagreement about the meaning of virtue and the forms of self-government, he writes with mounting excitement. If this says little, Sandel clarifies that the, that the agenda faces two specific challenges. One is to devise political institutions capable of governing the global economy. The other is to cultivate the civic identities necessary to sustain those institutions, to supply them with moral authority they require. Or, he writes that, to revitalize the civic strand of freedom, Americans must find a way to ask what economic arrangements are hospitable to self-government, and how the public life of a pluralist society might cultivate in citizens the expansive self-understanding that civic engagement requires. This is liberalism that has lost its moorings. Sandel runs on about moral authority and civil allegiances. The terms sound edifying and almost religious, but their meaning is obscure. The nouns pile up in neat mounds across the page. Civic virtue, civic identity, moral authority, common identity. To be sure, Sandel on occasion specifies activities that exemplify new citizenship. The practices seem worthy, but not particularly fresh or original, nor do they require a new rhetoric. He points to sprawlbusters, people who oppose national chain stores in their communities, or to new urbanists seeking to build communities more hospitable to a vibrant civic life. These are not stray examples of an earnest and woozy liberalism. The chatter on civic virtues and Republican purpose fills endless essays and talks. In well-appointed lecture halls, poker-faced professors gather to reflect on the crises of America before adjourning for the banquet dinner. What they offer is not wrong, but uplifting and vague. A more communitarian version of liberalism, writes Thomas A. Spragans Jr., a Duke University professor, would permit liberalism to recapture some of the normative complexity and moral weight that characterized its inception. 
Like Sandel, Spragans finds practical implications in this rhetoric. Liberals seek to design social institutions and policies in ways that promote civic friendship and a sense of common purpose. They will seek to promote institutions such as the public schools that bring people from different backgrounds together, and they will champion a public rhetoric of common identity and inclusiveness. Political theorists crank this stuff out by the truckload. Perhaps someone is buying. It is hard to protest the sentiment and ethos, but it is also hard to know what it means aside from a general support for the liberal state and democratic politics. The problem is, this liberalism has turned vapid because a left that kept it honest has disappeared or turned liberal or both. A left constituted the liberal backbone as the left vaporized the backbone went soft. The decline or fate of liberalism without a left might be glimpsed in the distance traveled since John Stuart Mill, whose name is often invoked by today's liberals. To put it crudely, page for page, sentence for sentence, Mill's writings delivered a kick that contemporary liberals never match. The new liberals have adopted an idiom that is uplifting without being transcendental, profound without being deep. The emergence of a watery liberalism derives not simply from a lack of talent or genius. Rather, Mill partook of a socialist world. He was drawn to utopian socialism and wrote sympathetically about socialism. His grip of economic realities may be one reason his prose and ideas retained an earthy radicalism his successors relinquish. One example, Mill defended private property, but he challenged as unacceptable landed property, that is, private ownership of tracts of land. When the sacredness of property is talked of, it should always be remembered that any such sacredness does not belong in the same degree to landed property. No man made the land. It is the original inheritance of the whole species. Its appropriation is wholly a question of general expediency. When private property and land is not expedient, it is unjust. It is some hardship to be born into the world and to find all nature's gifts previously engrossed. To reconcile people to this, it will always be necessary to convince them that the exclusive appropriation is good for mankind on the whole, themselves included. But this is what no sane being could be persuaded of. Everywhere return to market or civic thought can be charted. In an era of ideological decomposition, leftists advance only the most modest goals and ideas. Many politically engaged intellectuals, writes sociologist Jeffrey Alexander, have adopted ideas about the market as rational or liberating. We are witnessing the death of a major alternative not only in social thought but in society itself. Some left-leaning observers argue that the old political categories have lost their meaning. Time is chopped away at the differences between liberal and leftist, writes Michael Tomaski in his own book, Left for Dead, which tries to resuscitate a left. No one today can talk seriously about dismantling capitalism, for example, which was the main project of the left in America. Similarly, no one can talk seriously about the possibility of world socialism. For Tomaski, minor reforms of the market constitute the outermost boundaries of political aspiration. The first principle of a new left program is to produce a strategy to protect working families in the age of globalization. The problem is less the commendable goals, however, than the limited means. Inasmuch as global capitalism is irreversible, Tomaski argues that a left should not resist international trade agreements, but push for inclusion of an equalization tax so that goods made cheaply in the third world cannot undersell American goods. It hardly need be underlined that the notion of protective tariffs is not radical, and, in fact, a hint of a fundamental transformation does not tinge its pages. Tomaski attacks corporations and overcompensated executives, but believes that in an era, that in an era of sound bites, only when a presidential candidate or a party leader or some other major figure repeatedly attacks the hill, the ills, will these conditions begin to change. As is so often the case, the language of the practical reformer becomes spongy and vague. In addition to exemplary speeches, he calls for a rhetoric aimed at galvanizing working people around a positive idea. The potential they have as political partners to make corporations and politicians respond to them. Robert Kuttner's Everything for Sale, Closer to the Liberal Middle, 
exudes an even more cramped spirit. All he wishes to do is modify the marker or the market. He sees a, he sees himself as a critic of the pure laissez-faire economy, and an exponent of the mixed economy, a creation as American as Alexander Hamilton or Lyndon B. Johnson. He believes that the capitalist system is a superior form of economic organization that sometimes needs to be supplemented, corrected, and modified, for instance, in the field of healthcare. He offers a cogent criticism of the proposal and often reality that the profit-making corporations minister to the health needs of a population. Again, Kuttner has many reasonable things to say, but no one will pretend he is offering a strikingly different vision for America. His pros and pose bear the stamp of Washington think tanks. He seconds a proposal to create a new category of a responsible corporation that would receive tax breaks in exchange for decent environmental and employee provisions. Among other conditions, to qualify, a corporation would have to would have to contribute at least 3% of payroll to a portable multi-employer pension plan along the lines of plans offered by the TIAA CREF Teachers Pension Fund. This proposal also calls for a Tobin-style tax on short-term trading of securities. The idea presented in the language of Washington bureaucrats is less than riveting and is hardly comprehensible to the uninitiated Some of his other proposals score low on the plausibility scale. To counter profound American political apathy, Kuttner suggests a policy jury, something like a mock jury in which ordinary citizens are charged with resolving difficult public policy issues. After specialists make presentations, the juries come to a verdict. Why bored Americans who barely vote or read newspapers might take a week off to listen to experts drone about national health plans, or reforming the tax code is not immediately obvious. However, Kuttner knows about the process firsthand. I participated in one of these affairs whose subject was the budget deficit. I was the expert witness opposed by Republican Representative Vin Weber. Each of us was backed up by a team of specialists. Twelve ordinary people compensated with a trip to Washington in a modest honorarium, spent the better part of a week boning up on fiscal issues, At the end of the week, they voted to cut defense spending. Kuttner grandly notes that a foundation and a university footed the bill for this experiment in civic virtue. One need not be a right-wing crank to wonder if the monies could have been better spent than than whining and dining several teams of specialists and 12 outsiders for the better part of a week. Nor does one have to be a cynic to wonder about the ordinary citizens dragged into this affair. In any event, the proposal hardly comes to terms with political apathy. Oh, where am I? Paul Starr, who co-edits a political magazine with Kuttner, puts it forth rightly. Once socialism inspired liberalism with ambitious ideas of transformation, but no more, it is time to call it quits. The socialist project has been thoroughly discredited. Liberalism has no need of socialism. Socialism is simply not our appointed historical destiny. For Star, the old dream must be surrendered. The point is to modify, not transform. Reform capitalism, yes. Replace it, no. He calls for the end of an old love affair. When socialism was young and full of fervor, some liberals were understandably infatuated. But the romance should be over once and for all. Even a robust effort to invigorate radicalism like Ralph Miliband's Socialism for a Skeptical Age presents itself mildly and soberly. A socialist government would give a very high priority to the achievement of full employment and would seek to turn the right to work into turn the right to work into a reality. The right to work into a reality. He continues that a fundamental aspect of policy would be the provision of ample facilities for retraining and the renewal of skills. Once upon a time, leftists and radicals talked of liberation or the abolition of work. Now the talk is about full employment and retraining the workforce. Ira Katznelson, a leftist political scientist, explains why he believes that socialism must undergo an astringent tapering 
and becomes self-limiting. In Genteel Prose, he writes that socialism must give up the impossible dream of a future entirely without exploitation and embrace and embrace meliorative goals while recalling to liberalism the inherently social qualities of its own cherished norm of human autonomy. Past the sherry, Katz Nelson is to socialism as Sendell is to liberalism. Other socialists hold up, once again, familiar Scandinavian models. It is a useful thing to try to make the question of what could be a viable socialism in an advanced industrial society more specific, writes the socialist Bogdan Denich in After the Flood. For instance, something like a more advanced Sweden, Charles Derber in What's Left offers as a model Bosque cooperative factories in Mondragon, Spain. Mondragon is not a household name, but it should be. It may soon become so, he writes optimistically. In Mondragon, he finds work, worker-owned and managed enterprises that could be emulated. Even hard-boiled socialists confirm the widespread drift into policy proposals. Socialists now present themselves as practical businessmen. They have dispensed with radical sentiments and foggy utopias. John E. Romer, a well-regarded leftist thinker, opens his Future for Socialism by noting the collapse of Soviet communism, but he argues that an alternative socialism or market socialism is still possible and desirable. He wants a socialism that would aim for both efficiency and equality. He sketches out a realistic model which turns on what one of his champions calls a relatively simple device, the distribution of coupons. The simple scheme is relatively complex, requiring the establishment of non-convertible coupons, giving ownership in corporations and companies. These are delivered to citizens in an egalitarian manner and are given up at death, bestowing on all equal partnership or all equal ownership in society's wealth. They cannot be sold or surrendered, which prevents new inequalities from arising. The benefits are numerous. One should expect then that the poor will be controlling groups, will be the controlling group in most firms, as they own the majority of coupons. Thus, the firms will choose their levels of investments in the interest of the poor. Is this plan practical or possible? It presupposes a completely egalitarian redistribution of assets. All citizens receive the same amount of coupons and ownership in society's resources. Donald Trump and the hotel maid will get equal shares in what was once his hotel. What are the prospects for this? Nil. To put it another way, these are practical reforms that require a revolution. The scheme presents itself as a limited proposal that has been method- methodically thought out, an example of a new non-utopian and tough-minded socialism. Indeed, Romer includes an appendix in which he calculates to the tenth of a cent the profit dividend each adult in the United States would have received if the coupon economy had been in operation during the post-war decades. For instance, he estimates that in 1989, each adult would have received $310.414, much worse than in 1988 when everyone would have pocketed $820.794. Socialism here has contracted to the idea of equality defined by coupons, incentives, and competition. Fight for socialism and win $310.41. Romer admits that socialists should consider themselves victorious if they can design systems that bring about the degree of income equality and level of public services that exist in the Nordic social democracies. This is not a stray example. Much contemporary socialist thought seeks to be practical in market terms. Another leftist emphasizes that pragmatic market socialism has little to do with past socialism. James E. James A. Yunker, a professor of economics, advocates a socialism devoted to equality in which corporate power will be concentrated in what he calls a bureau of public ownership. He regrets that in the past socialists demanded capitalism too broadly. Although their intention was to galvanize support for socialism, these ill-considered charges against capitalism may have seriously weakened the socialist cause by suggesting that its adherents were mostly harebrained enthusiasts driven by utopian fantasies. 
His pragmatic market socialism, on the other hand, is a very precise and conservative formulation of socialism. Juncker demonstrates how conservative it is. His market socialism will somewhat increase the equality of income distribution, with the emphasis on the adverb somewhat. That is all. Neither will it necessarily have any significant beneficial effect on recognized social problems such as alienation, crime, drug abuse, racism, sexism, environmental degradation, militarism, and imperialism. This is a socialism suitable for capitalism. Donald Weiss, a leftist professor, argues in the specter of capitalism and the promise of a classless society that recent events have refuted much, but not all, of Marxism. The idea of a classless society, a classless society, not only is desirable, but is becoming increasingly feasible. How is it possible to achieve a classless society when everything seems to militate against it? Easier than ever even Romer suspected, dismantle public education. <laughs> For this Marxist, public education perpetuates class differences. A competitive market in education would bring us nearer to the goal of the classless society than our public system can get us. What? What? I don't get it. How? Socialism, or what remains of the socialist idea, namely a classless society, can be introduced by a voucher system, an economically essential moment of the overthrow of classes. At the fin de siècle, Marxism seeks an afterlife as a more perfect capitalism. Oh boy. Another venture to fan the flames that will warm no one belongs to Michael Albert, a long-term socialist writer and publisher. His thinking forward combines agitrop and academic chit-chat with a dreary vision of the future. Albert is so pleased with his idea of participatory economics that he has given it an acronym, PERICON, and with a keen sense of its import, he titles his last chapter, Reactions to PERICON, and What's Next for PERICON. He wants to distinguish PERICON from market socialism. Some sense of the beast comes across in his description of its aim. To reduce to a minimum, if possible to zero, the possibility of socially counterproductive self-advancement, to prevent some people from living better than others unless they had undergone greater personal sacrifice. If this sounds a bit grim, he assures us that in Pericon, esteem and social recognition for outstanding abilities that create great social benefits for others will be very high. Lest this leave the masses unmoved, Albert's elegant prose might provoke them. The difference in a participatory economy from all those that have gone before is not that nobody will ever have to perform a task they dislike, but that any task in anyone's job complex, complex that is not gratifying is there because it would be unfair if it were absent. Those who never fell in love have, have less to fear, perhaps for this reason, some of the sharpest criticism of the market comes from so socialists or liberals. Uh, sorry, comes not from socialists or liberals, but from conservatives, free of guilt and apology. The terms here may not may not precise may not be precise. What is conservatism today? In any event, two writers associated with Business Week have written a more spirited attack on market capitalism than anyone on the. Um, contemporary left. William Woolman and Anne Kolomoska Col Col in the Judas Economy, the Triumph of Capital and the Betrayal of Work do not simply defend wage workers but question the success of unfettered capitalism. The unraveling of the Soviet Empire signified a Western victory in the Cold War. It also damaged the case for milder forms of state intervention, ranging from democratic socialism to such gentle free market reforms as America's New Deal. Not only heirs of Marx, but those of Franklin D. Roosevelt and Lyndon B. Johnson lost out. Today, even the left-wing parties extol the private sector, doubting the government's ability to serve the public. Yet Woolman and, and Kolomoska recall a truth the left tries to soft pedal. The economic pathology of communist and socialist states does not by itself prove the case against government. The state has done enough good and the unfettered free market enough harm in the industrial countries of the West 
during the 20th century to raise serious concerns about the ultimate impact of the right-wing drift of economic policy throughout the industri industrial world. To be sure, these authors harbor no far-reaching vision of the future. They anticipate crises and limited employment, but call for only limited reforms, grounded in the possible, a better balance between labor and capital. In short, they believe capitalism must be saved from itself. The issue is the decline of a utopian vision that once imbued leftists and liberals. The point is hardly that improved air, enhanced welfare, or a broader democracy is bad. The question rather is the extent a commitment is the extent a commitment to reasonable measures supplants a commitment to unreasonable ones, those more subversive and visionary. Can liberalism with a backbone exist if its left turns mushy? Does radicalism persist if reduced to means and methods? Does the left survive if it, if it abandons a utopian hope or plan? The idea of utopia, commented T.W. Adorno some years ago, has disappeared completely from the conception of socialism. Thereby, the apparatus, that the how, the means of socialist society have taken over any possible content. To be sure, even those with little familiarity with Marxism know its founders denounced utopian socialism and prized scientific and practical approaches. This is only half right. Marxism and utopianism did not exist as simple opposites. Yet it is true that the utopian spirit remained alive mainly among the the dissenting leftists from Paul Lefargue and William Morris to Walter Benjamin and Ernst Bloch. These thinkers protested an idea of the future as an improved model of the present, where labor was not abolished or minimized, but simply better compensated. On this very issue, Lefargue, Lefargue Marx's son-in-law, penned in 1883 a caustic pamphlet attacking the, the fetish of work, the right to be lazy. Lefargue argued that only that not only economists and moralists, but socialists and laborers believe that more work is the cure for social and personal ills. His pamphlet opened with a parody of the opening of the Communist Manifesto. A strange delusion possesses the working class, the working classes. This delusion is the love of work, the furious passion for work. The religion of work has spread throughout society, maiming and crippling individuals although Lefargue notes that the rich preach work, but choose leisure. Though the ancient world understood that work was a curse, modern industrial society spreads its gospel. The working class, Lefargue hopelessly hoped, must reject the work fetish. It must demand the rights, the rights of laziness, restricting labor to three hours and reserving the rest of the day and night for leisure and feasting. If uprooting from its heart the vice which dominates it and degrades its nature, the working class were not to demand the rights of man, not to demand the right to work, which is but the right to misery, but to forge a brazen law forbidding any man to work more than three hours a day. The earth, the old earth, trembling with joy, would feel a new universe leaping within her. On this topic, Walter Benjamin as well excoriated the conventional socialists, who resurrected the old Protestant ethic of work and believed that factory labor constituted technological progress. Against these cramped ideas, Benjamin returned to utopians like Charles Fourier, whose fantasies, which have so often been ridiculed, proved to be surprisingly sound. For a practical world, Fourier's writings are anathema. He dreamed of androgynous planets, a libertine sexual order, and a paradise of food, even the poorest would eat five times a day with a choice of 12 types of soup, 12 types of bread and wine, and 12 dressings for meat and vegetables. Unlike Kuttner, who proposes policy juries, Fourier com uh, commended tasting juries. He anticipated, as his biogra biographer puts it, a day when the wars of civilization would be replaced by what amounted to international cooking contests. No one is attacked more extravagantly, the religion of commerce. Wisdom, virtue, morality, all these have fallen out of fashion. Everybody worships at the shrine of commerce. A nation's true greatness, what the, what the economists regard as its true glory, is to sell more pairs of trousers to the neighboring empire than it buys from them. Over the years and against conventional wisdom, utopians sustained a vision of life beyond the market. 
Amid the revolutionary surges following World War I, the Hungarian George Lucas set forth a theory of the old and new culture, in which he argued that socialist economy was not the goal. It was simply a precondition for humanity to advance to a new and humane culture. Most radicals do not understand that political power and economic reorganization is not the end all, stated Lucas. The goal is not a new economic order, but freedom from an obsession with economics. We can clarify this with a very simple example. Someone is racking his brain over a complex scientific problem, but during his work he, he contracts an unrelenting toothache. Clearly, in most cases, he would be unable to remain in the stream of his thought and work until the immediate pain is relieved. The annihilation of capitalism, the new socialist reconstruction of the economy, means the healing of all toothaches for the whole of humanity. The healing of all toothaches for the whole of humanity. That this statement can no longer be thought, much less restated, bespeaks the end of utopia.